everyone and welcome to our Reefs Go Live episode today entitled Cayman Reefs Over Time Responses and Actions. My name is Maisie and I am a marine scientist at the Central Caribbean Marine Institute and I am lucky enough to be your host today. Our underwater educator for today's broadcast is the amazing Dr. Claire Dell, who we are going to introduce you to in just one moment. So we're very, very excited to get started today. And this is not our first Reefs Go Live of the season. So you guys at home and school should know what's up. We have the YouTube screen, which should be on your screen. And if you have any questions at all, then please put them to the chat box, which is just to the right of that screen. And we would like you guys to send us as many questions as possible throughout this broadcast and like you to get as involved as you possibly can be. Now, you should also have an in-class activity sheet. So please keep that close to you. And we are going to start filling that in as the lesson progresses. So before we get started and before I hand you over to Claire, I'm just going to recap what our lesson objectives are. So we are going to be understanding the changes in Cayman reefs over time. We are going to be looking at the characteristics of a healthy reef, the characteristics of a degraded reef, and some of the stresses that have caused this change from a healthy to an unhealthy environment. And then together, we are going to come up with some solutions to make sure that the reefs around the Cayman Islands stay nice and healthy. So it looks like we're all ready to get started up here. So without further ado, Claire, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. And hi, Maisie and the team up there. From the lobster, the three sharks, and the underwater team, Welcome to this reef. It's so great you could join us. My name is Claire and I'm one of the researchers at CCMI and we've got some really interesting things to show you down here today. Sweet. Well, we are so excited to get started. So to start with our first section of this broadcast, what is actually a healthy reef and why is it so important? Absolutely. <laughs> so the name of this lesson, yes, is Healthy Reefs. And the way we can think about healthy reefs is to understand how able the reef is to provide the things that we need. So I'm right here next to this beautiful big boulder coral here. And as you know, all of us who live on islands rely on reefs as protection from wave energy and erosion and from storms. And these corals do an excellent job of protecting us. Also, this beautiful range of corals are very pretty. And tourists come and spend lots of money on these reefs to see all these beautiful corals and fish. Also, we rely on the reef for food. There are lots of fish around me right now. It's really beautiful down here. And so that's another reason that these reefs are so important. But did you also know that there are a lot of compounds that come from reef organisms that are being used in skin care, cosmetics, and in medicine? There are, in fact, 12 compounds derived from reef organisms that have made it through to clinical trials as anti-cancer agents. And we all know that's a pretty big deal, right? And so reefs are hugely important to all of us, but especially those of us living on island nations. And so reef health describes the ability of these reefs to provide those services to us. Wow, that is so exciting, Claire. And I had no idea that there was those 12 compounds that are, you know, helping in medical trials. That is so exciting. Okay, so we've learned what a healthy reef is and, you know, why it can be important for us. But to our divers that are watching at home, can you describe some key characteristics so that they know when they are diving or snorkeling on a healthy reef? Of course I can. <laughs> Let me show you. Now, as you've learned in previous Reefs Go Live broadcasts, reefs are built by corals, which are tiny animals. 
that you can see here, very similar to sea anemones. And they build a limestone skeleton that over time accumulates to form this structure that you see here. And it's this structure that acts like a self-repairing seawall, and it's this structure that provides the habitat for all of these other reef organisms to survive. And so the amount of coral on the reef is a hugely uh, important measure of how healthy the reef is. And we measure it using <laughs> this high-tech piece of equipment here, a PVC pipe that is a meter long. And what we do is we lie it down on the reef and count the number of centimeters in that one meter distance that the reef has coral growing on it. Then we also make a note of the different species. So you can see there are these boulder formations and there are also these finger and lettuce type formations. And this is really important because these boulder corals do a better job of holding back the wave erosion and these finger corals form a great habitat for fish. And so having this mixture of species is really important. And then while we're on corals, we also make a note of any disease. And so you can see these corals here are all looking pretty healthy, which is great because that means that they're able to build a reef and keep the reef functioning and providing for us. One other measurement of the reef and the corals is reef height. Again, with my handy meter stick. And what we do is we put it down and measure the height of the reef. And you can see up by me, it's about two meters tall, which is impressive because it tells us that this reef does an excellent job of holding back those storms and providing this structure for all of these other organisms, like the sharks and the lobster who we just saw wandering by. Wow, thank you for showing us that, Claire. How exciting that you guys watching got to see some real-life research techniques there. And, you know, sometimes science equipment isn't, you know, the most fanciest or most developed, but a simple bit of PVC has allowed us to do some really key measurements on the reef, which is, as I said, a really great thing for you guys to witness. Now, Claire, we were just talking about some of the different types of coral. So like the branching corals, where you were saying that you're seeing some habitats for the fish to live inside. So if we have more corals, especially more of these branching corals, then is another characteristic of a healthy reef going to be an increased amount and diversity of fish and invertebrates like the lobsters? That's absolutely another thing that we measure and we use to describe the health of the reef. And again, <laughs> done with this very high-tech piece of equipment. <laughs> and what we do is that we swim along the reef, counting all of the different fish that we see, writing it down on our slates and estimating their size to within these 10 centimeter categories because fish not only do we like to eat them very tasty but also they do a very important role on the reef and we'll come back to that in a minute and so yes Maisie you're quite right we swim along the reef and look at these different fish species around to understand what is on the reef and what roles they are able to do. Yeah, definitely. We've actually just had our first question in asking if there are any hammerhead sharks that are on the reef. Now, I haven't been lucky enough to see one, but in a healthy reef ecosystem, is the potential for seeing a hammerhead shark greater than it would be in an unhealthy area? 
Yes, that's absolutely right. And you know I've been lucky enough to see a hammerhead. Just, uh, just near here. It was beautiful. Cruised by a few times and then moved off. <laughs> but yes, the healthier the system, the more of those upper levels can be supported because there are more fish uh, living there. So, so yes, having those top levels is, uh, is a great indication. Great question. <laughs> wow, that's so great. Thank you for that question that has just come in. Now, we've listed some key characteristics just now of a healthy reef. We have coral cover, the coral species, the health of the coral, the reef height, and the number and the size of the fish. But I actually did notice something, Claire, when you were looking at the coral cover. I actually noticed quite a lot of, not a lot of seaweed down there. Now, I've been snorkeling and diving on lots of different reefs, and some of them have lots of seaweed, and some of them don't have very much at all. Now, is this an indicator of a healthy or an unhealthy reef? That's an excellent observation, yes. So, seaweed is a huge problem on the reef, and uh, yes, <laughs> We definitely measure that in the same way by putting our meter stick down and this time counting the number of centimeters of the reef that have seaweed growing on it. And I'm going to give this piece of equipment a back now before we talk a bit more about that. So I'm going to <laughs> ask Kate, who works with me, to come and collect it. And you would have seen her yesterday in our promotional video. So Kate, if you can wave to everybody and you might go and check out her video on YouTube. Thank you so much. So, <laughs> yes, seaweed is a big, big problem because it reduces the uh, growth of corals, it reduces their reproductive output and their survival by increasing the likelihood that they will get diseased and by releasing chemicals that can kill the corals. And so reefs and corals do much better when there's far less seaweed around. So that is a key indicator of reef health. And you don't see too much in these areas where we are right now. But we'll show you a comparison in a bit. No, that sounds great. Thank you for that bit of information, Claire. And actually, the question that I just asked about the seaweed leads very well into the next section of this broadcast, which is what are some of the stresses that the reef health is currently facing? So would you like to get us started on some of the stresses that we're finding globally? Yes, <laughs> I'd be happy to. <laughs> so... Seaweed is one of those big ones, but it doesn't apply everywhere. Now, the stressors that coral reefs are facing, and this is not uh, just the Cayman Islands, this is around the world, the stressors fall into two categories. We talk about global, which impact the whole planet, and then local, which only impact different areas. So the main global stressor are the, is the increase in temperature. And this has very negative effects because it directly stresses the corals, which can cause them to bleach and to die in huge numbers. But the second issue with increasing temperatures is that it's leading to more severe storms. And so there's this added physical damage on the reef. Now on top of that are the local stressors. And you will know when you go to the reefs in the Cayman Islands, which ones impact the areas that you use and you visit. And so we talked about seaweed being one big one. But for example, an area near a construction site might be more impacted by sedimentation getting onto the reef. Or another area near a boat ramp could be more impacted by anchor or diver damage. So there are, yeah, these two main groups, the 
temperature increase, and then these local stressors, which include all sorts of things, including invasive species, coral disease, and other things. Wow, thanks for describing that, Claire. And we've actually just had a question that has come in from Charlie, and I would like you to either categorize this to a global or a local stressor. But he is asking whether or not overfishing is a stressor on the reef and if it affects reef health. Overheating, Maisie. Uh, overfishing. Overfishing. <laughs> um, yes, that is definitely a stressor. So, do you remember we talked about how seaweed is such a problem on the reef? And that corals do far better when there's less of it. Well, this is why the fish populations are so important. Because some of them eat the seaweeds and help keep the corals in better conditions. And from work that we've been doing at CCMI, we found out that there are some key species that perform this role. One or two species of parrotfish, squab, a species of sergeant fish, and also the Bermuda chub. And I saw one hovering about earlier, but I don't see it now, so that's too bad. <laughs> and so because of that, the, the uh, overfishing can be a big problem because it limits, the, it, well, it can limit the number of herbivores on the reef, meaning that there are fewer of them to eat the seaweed, meaning that this one stressor for corals increases. Ah, here comes a parrotfish. Perfect timing. <laughs> Yay! Thank you, mate. Well done. <laughs> Well, that was a great question, Charlie, and thank you so much for sending it in. So we've had, you know, a pretty broad discussion about the global stressors and the local stressors. Um, can you maybe give an example of some of the stressors that we may potentially be finding here, specifically in the Cayman Islands? Well, the seaweed is a big problem in the Cayman Islands, sadly, and I can point out a few pieces around and about growing on the reef here. Now, that occurs on all three islands, I'm sorry to say, and throughout the whole Caribbean. But the Cayman Islands has done a great job of limiting a lot of the other stressors. And so the mooring system means that there's much less anchor damage, which is fabulous. And the marine parks have been set up, which limits the areas where fishing can take place. And again, as we mentioned before, that means that there's more of those herbivores on the reef to eat that pesky seaweed. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that, Claire. And we've actually just had one question that's come in from Avril, and she's asking, asking if snorkeling can negatively affect the reef. Well, it depends on how you do it, you know. So if you're very careful not to touch the reef and careful where you kick your fins, then you can have no impact which is a really great way to snorkel. But if you're all over the place and you're touching things and kicking things, then you're going to damage the reef. Also thinking about the sunscreen that you use before you get in the water can impact the reef. So snorkeling can be a very minimal impact activity or you can do some damage so be careful when you're out snorkeling and get comfortable above the reef before you get too close to it yeah i totally agree claire and i think we're going to touch on some more solutions to some of these stresses later on in the broadcast so we'll hold off on them until later on but we've just had one more question come in um, just before we go on to our next section and we've had a question asking how many species of fish do you think are on this healthy reef section that you're on right now 
<laughs> Big question. I wasn't ready for that. Okay, I might get my whole team to help me. Let me see. I've seen at least five species of parrotfish or squab. Black turgeon, the prop props, uh, chromis. I've seen snappers and grunts and barjacks. Uh, wait, well, yes, those two species of shark. Um, let me have another look around. And there's a huge school in the distance. I don't know if we can <laughs> show I, you. Oh, I don't know. Um, let's say 20. Let's say rats. Yeah. <laughs> At least 20 different species that we've seen just swimming around on this broadcast. And they're only the ones that are big enough for us to see when we're not super, super close to them. So, <laughs> lots and right. lots of biodiversity. Ah, oh, amazing. We've just seen a Bermuda chub. Oh, perfect. What well, a wonderful herbivore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but he's camera shy. He took off. Okay. <laughs> we might come back to him later. <laughs> yeah. But what is clear to see from everyone at home and school that is watching is that this is a vibrant and beautiful, healthy reef section and has all of those key characteristics that we were speaking about earlier. But because there is lots of stressors, sometimes these areas can become degraded and they become unhealthy. So, Claire, if you wouldn't mind traveling to a slightly unhealthier section of the reef so that we can kind of go and see some of the characteristics of this area so that the divers watching at home and school are able to identify these unhealthy reef areas. With me. Now, I just want to show you this next patch, which is quite close by, but it does show the characteristics of what degraded reefs look like. And so when you see this sort of area on a much bigger scale, <laughs> you're in trouble. So what we're looking at now are lots more seaweed cover and far less coral cover, unfortunately. And what we're also seeing is much less structure. So whereas before, when I held up my meter stick, it was two meters of coral height, here there's far less to measure. And the problem with this, of course, is that it means that the reef has less ability to hold back those waves and those storms and less ability to provide homes for fish and lobsters and other things. So it's a very unfortunate state of affairs. The reef is also much less pretty and so you don't get the same number of tourists visiting when your entire reef looks like this small patch here. So there are some big differences actually, you know, and uh, the structure is a very clear one to see, but um, we see a lot more seaweed here, and I can show you this in a bit more detail. These are some samples that I collected, especially for you at home, everybody, to show you the different types of seaweeds that you can see on the reef. Now, these two are brown species, and they are found all over the reef. And this one in particular is the one that the Bermuda chub likes to eat. And that's what we found out here at CCMI doing our work. And <laughs> nobody cares about the Bermuda chub, but I think you should, because this is a problem species of seaweed, and that's the only fish that eats it. And so you see lots of these on the reef. But then this is another one, and it's a green one. And did you know that its skeleton is made out of limestone, the same as corals? And when it dies, it breaks down, and it forms the sand that we have on our beaches. So there's all sorts of varieties of seaweed, but you see more of them on degraded reefs in this sort of state. 
I'll get out the way so you can see a bit more clearly. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely see from the video stream up here that that reef really doesn't look as, you know, as vibrant and it doesn't look as biodiverse as the coral reefs that we were looking at before. So if I was a tourist, then I think that I would like to go snorkeling there as much as I would like to. Just, you know, over that way a little bit where it was a little bit nicer and there was so much biodiversity around. Now, before we kind of move on to our next section, Claire, I just wanted to check how you're doing on air down there. Thank you so much, Maisie. Yes, I've got 1,500, so I'm doing well. 1,500, wow, that's great. Okay, we've actually had a couple of questions that are coming in. And we have one question on. that has come in, and it is, does the sargasm, because there's quite a lot of it at the moment, does that damage the corals? Well, it can. The sargassum is washing in, and it's on the surface, mostly because it comes in from elsewhere. But when it dies and begins to break down, it can cover and smother the corals. So in certain pockets, perhaps, but normally it's, it's above the reef. There are some species of sargassum that grow on the reef. I wonder if I can find one. But they're not normally that much of a problem because the fish can eat them. But the ones that wash in, in certain circumstances, they could cause a problem. But it's, it's not usually a big issue. Okay, thanks for all that information, Claire. That was really interesting. Now, we've had another question in as well, um, asking, what does littering do to coral reefs? Ah, oh. <laughs> yes, please don't litter. <laughs> it's, it's very bad for all sorts of marine life. So, plastics in particular can be a problem because... Not only can they land on the reef and smother it, but all other marine animals get caught up, literally, in plastic litter. And seabirds can consume it and get impacted. But also, when the plastic breaks down, it forms these very, very, very small compounds and pieces that animals can eat and it affects their growth and their reproduction and they, those things travel up in the food web and so impact all of the levels of, of the food chain. So litter is a big problem and that actually is one of the reasons that mangroves and seagrasses are so important. But we can touch on that in a bit. Yeah, that sounds great, Claire. We're actually going to go straight into that section next after we've had a quick recap. So, divers watching us at home, we have spoken about what a healthy coral reef is, what are some of the key characteristics that we find there, what are some of the stresses that are facing coral reefs, and we've also just now spoken about some of the characteristics of a degraded reef with that lack of structure and lots of seaweed and it not looking as vibrant as those healthy areas. So now I would like all of us to work together and I would like you to get out your in-class activity sheets because this may give you some clues in this section. But I want us to come up with some solutions to some of the stresses that are facing coral reefs. So to get us started, Claire, I would like you please to come up with a suggestion and a solution as to how we can keep our coral reefs nice and healthy and remove these stresses. Well, this is perfect timing because there's a great example here of a bleached coral. And Sam's going to be able to show you that in close up. Now, this is a sign of stress and the bleaching when the corals lose their colour can be to a variety of factors including disease or maybe the seaweed that's growing next to it 
But when you see it in huge areas, then it's probably due to thermal stress. And so this leads me seamlessly onto one of the recommendations, which would be to think about your carbon footprint. And maybe, Maisie, you can explain a bit more about that in a minute. But I just want to follow on from uh, the point about mangroves and seagrasses, because they are so important. And that's not just in the Cayman Islands, but that's around the world where they grow. They do all sorts of jobs. They protect the reefs in the sea next to them, and they protect the island. And they're an important nursery area for lots of the fish that we like to eat. And so right to my left here are some schoolmasters. And these are one of the species where the juveniles hide out in the mangroves and sea grasses until they're big enough to survive life on the reef. Now, mangroves and seagrasses also act like a sieve, holding back that litter and the extra fertilizer from golf courses or agriculture or other stressors from land. And so it means that the, those things don't get onto the reef and impact it. But then the seagrasses and mangroves also act like a buffer system protecting the shore from wave erosion and storms. So they're so important for all sorts of reasons. And uh, that would be probably my first suggestion. Keep mangroves and seagrasses healthy. But maybe, Maisie, you can explain the temperature if we have time. Yeah, of course I can, but i just like to reiterate that mangroves and seagrasses are so important because they, you know, they protect the coral reefs from all the sediments coming off, and they also provide more fish because they're a nursery ground. So that is such a great suggestion, Claire. So thank you so much for giving us that one. And you're right, I'm actually now going to explain a little bit about how increasing temperature actually occurs around the planet. So I would like you guys watching to pretend that you are standing inside of a greenhouse. Now, it's very, very hot inside of there because the glass that is all the way around is trapping all of that sunlight and heat inside of there, which is why the plants grow so well. Now, my suggestion is to reduce down our carbon footprints. But what does that really mean? Well, carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, is released when you are burning fossil fuels. So if you're driving your car or if you are having your lights or your air conditioning on. And going back to the theme of a greenhouse, what this carbon dioxide does is it forms a layer around the planet. And these are called greenhouse gases. Now, they naturally occur, but by us burning fossil fuels, we are increasing the amount of greenhouse gases around our planet. And just like the glass of a greenhouse, this layer of gases actually traps heat around the Earth, and this causes it to get much hotter, which has a global effect and is really increasing our sea temperatures and is causing things like coral bleaching that Claire just pointed out. So my suggestion is for us to try and reduce down our carbon emissions by maybe doing something like walking to school and not forgetting to turn off the lights and air conditioning when we leave the rooms. So that is my suggestion so far and you've had one from Claire as well. So please do start sending yours in and we'll see what suggestions you have at home as well. So we've actually just got one in now from Adam. And Adam is saying that he is going to try to use less plastic. And I think that is a great suggestion. Do you mind expanding on that a little bit more, Claire? Well, yes, but we've got 
some, another suggestion, just swimming past right now. We've got a lot of blue tag and Bermuda chub in a school just going by doing their thing. So I'm just going to put that out <laughs> as a quick reminder of another suggestion that we could think about. But yes, the plastic is a problem, not just because it can get caught on the reef and smother and prevent corals from getting access to light, but it also gets eaten by all sorts of marine organisms and can get accumulated in the food chain and impact animals' growth and reproduction. So yes, anything that you can do to stop using plastic to uh, recycle more is excellent. So great suggestion. Well done. Yeah, great suggestion, Adam, and thank you so much for sending that in. Now, before we address some more suggestions, I actually have a question that has just come in from Malachi, who is asking, how long does it take for coral reefs to recover? Oh, big question. Uh, <laughs> well, I think that forms the basis of hundreds of PhDs and years worth of research. <laughs> That's um, a brilliant question, but there are all sorts of factors that uh, tie into that. So it depends on what the reef has been stressed by. Is it a stress that just happened once for a short period, say like high temperatures just for a, a couple of days? Or is it something that's been ongoing over years and years and years? Also, what condition was the reef in to begin with? Were there corals that, after the stress ended, were able to grow and produce more corals? Because if there was a lot of coral around, then the recovery will be quicker. But if there's only these odd few corals here and there, like there would be in that degraded patch where we, we looked earlier, then recovery would be much harder um, and take far longer. So um, <laughs> that's such a great question. It's also one that a lot of researchers are <laughs> spending their careers trying to figure out. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. So thank you so much for that question. And as Claire said, I think it just all depends on the reef area that you are in and how many corals are left in that area is going to depend on how long it takes to recover. Now, we've had one more suggestion that has come in from Zara. And Zara said that she is going to try and help keep our coral reefs nice and healthy by thinking about what fish she wants to eat because you just spoke about the herbivores being really important and I think she wants to be super careful about what she's eating. So can you expand upon that at all, Claire? Excellent suggestion, Zara. <laughs> so when we saw those blue tag and the Bermuda chub swimming past, I was hoping somebody would pick up on that. <laughs> yes, spot on. The more herbivores that are on the reef, and from the work that we've done, we found that to be some species of parrotfish, surgeon fish, and the blue tang. But also, there's that urchin which we'll cover in the reefs go live lesson in a few weeks so make sure you tune in for that so yes having more herbivores on the reef will keep the seaweed levels down and give the conditions give the corals the best conditions for growing so excellent suggestion yes yeah that was a great suggestion Sarah and if anyone watching would like any more information about you know where what the fishing laws are in the Cayman Islands then please do visit the Department of Environment's website because they have all the information about all of our fishing regulations as well as the areas which are designated marine parks and marine protected areas around all three islands so do check that website out it is a great resource 
Okay, Claire, how are you doing on air down there? I have 1,000 PSI, Maisie. 1,000 PSI. Okay, well, we're going to answer one or two more questions or suggestions, and then we will have to end our broadcast, I'm afraid. But we've just had one question in now from Peyton, and he is asking how big can a coral reef grow? Peyton, <laughs> Peyton, it can grow so big it can be seen from space. On, off Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, it extends for kilometres and kilometres and kilometres so that astronauts up in their spaceships can see it on the planet. They can be totally massive. Um, so, yes, we don't have that sort of space here in the Cayman Islands, but yes, they can grow totally, totally huge. Yeah, I totally agree, Claire. So, I used to live in Australia and I was lucky enough to visit the Great Barrier Reef. So, that was an awesome thing to see because you can see it from space. How cool is that? But the most important thing is that the only reefs that are growing and getting this big are generally the healthy reefs. So, we really do need to try and remove the stresses that are surrounding them so we can try and keep them nice and healthy so they can keep growing into these huge, impressive structures. Right, okay, we have our last suggestion that has just come in from Charlie. And Charlie is saying, and I know that we touched on this a little bit earlier as well, but Charlie is saying that he is not going to touch any coral reefs or any algae at all, which I think is a great idea. Do you think that's a good idea too, Claire? I do. <laughs> I thoroughly support that. When you look at this beautiful structure here, you've got to remember that corals are tiny animals, so small, and that they are quite fragile. And if you are landing on them, or kicking things over them, or scraping them with an anchor, or whatever it is, you're going to harm the corals, just like what would happen if our body got cut. It's going to open up the possibility of infection, and it's going to mean that the corals have less energy for growing, surviving, and building this reef. So the less that you can do physically to, to harm the corals, the better chance you're giving them. So great suggestion. Yeah, really good one. great suggestion, Charlie. And I would just like to add that obviously we saw Claire touching some algae earlier. And the only reason that she was touching it is because they were samples that she had collected for her scientific research. So that is the only reason why she was touching those. But if you guys are on the reef and you're not touching anything, then that is great because that is going to keep the coral reefs nice and healthy because it removes the stress of you touching them underwater. Right, all right, Claire. Well, I'm afraid we've actually run out of time for our broadcast. It's already been 45 minutes, so it is time to finish up. So do you have any parting words for our awesome underwater explorers that have joined us for this broadcast? Well, we've just had a turtle stop by. <gasps> what? <laughs> on the surface up there, and I, I wonder if you'll be able to see it on the camera, but it's there, so it's yeah. able to come say goodbye to us. We can see just a little teeny tiny bit on the camera. <laughs> oh, so glad you can as well. Um, so what I would say to the uh, underwater explorers out there is uh, thank you so much for your input in our class and for joining us down here on the reef today. Um, please, uh, if you're interested in knowing more about our research, visit the CCMI website, YouTube channel, and our social media and see if you can get more involved. Also, if you're of school age, 
then why not think about joining us for uh, CCAMP or some of our educational programs? The information is on the website and it would be great to have you with us this summer. So, on behalf of the team underwater, thanks again for your suggestions and your actions. It's been a really great time here. Take care. <laughs> great, thank you so much for that, Claire. And that turtle actually just left us from the surface here and dive back down to you guys. So, you may see it in just one moment. But I would just like to reiterate everything that Claire just said. A big thank you for joining us here today. Um, we have covered a lot of topics. We've spoken about how the coral reef has changed over time in Cayman. We have looked at the differences between a healthy coral reef and an unhealthy coral reef. And we have discussed some of the stresses that are causing this change and then talked about some of the great solutions that you guys at home have come up with to try and keep our coral reefs around the Cayman Islands nice and healthy. So we have tried to answer as many questions as we can during this broadcast, but you guys have had so many, which is great. If you have any last minute questions, then please do send them through on the chat box. And once Claire gets up, we will try and answer as many of those as we can for you and post them on our YouTube page in a couple of days. But that is essentially it from us. We have another Reefs Go Live broadcast next week on fabulous food chains on the exact same time and day. So please join us for that. And we really look forward to seeing you then. I hope you have a lovely afternoon at school and at home. So bye guys. See you next week.